Hello, my name is Pastor Tim Brewington, and I am the pastor of Fellowship Church. At Fellowship Church, we're just ordinary people who have experienced extraordinary life in Jesus Christ. And our mission is to tell others what we have experienced so that they too can experience this wonderful Jesus that we serve. I would like to send a personal invitation to you, your friends, and your family to join us at one of our worship services. You will find that we are a community of believers that focus on the word of God, worship, and praise. During our worship services, we believe in just letting the Holy Spirit have his way. So please join us at one of our worship services. God bless you. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. And we will begin our reading at verse 1. We will read verses 1 through 11. You probably will not cover everything within this text today. So if the Lord says the same, we will come back to the same place on next Sunday. But as we read first, uh, Second Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, I would that you would pay careful attention to the words that are in this scripture and allow God to speak to you as we read. Second Peter chapter 1 beginning with verse 1 says this letter is from Simon Peter a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, our Lord. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Verse 4. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Verse 8, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege and an honor it is to 
sit in this holy place today amongst them that are sanctified. We thank you, Dave, for the movement of your spirit, the settlement of your presence. I pray, God, as we sit through these next moments, that our hearts and our minds will be open to receive what you have to say to us today. And that when we leave this place, we will not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. Jesus, we need to hear from you today. In the name of Jesus. Penetrate our thinking, penetrate our circumstances, penetrate our worldview, penetrate anything that's blocking us from hearing you. Break down the divide between us so that we can hear from you today in the name of Jesus. We love you and we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord God, we thank you for your presence. My um, undergraduate degree is in biology. And as many of you know, biology is a study of life and living organisms. One of the things you learn as a biologist is that in order for something to be living, it must be growing moving and changing. That's how you know whether something is alive. So human beings are considered living because we're constantly growing, moving, and changing. But trees are also considered to be living because they too are growing, moving, and changing. Sometimes with a, a tree, if the wind is not blowing it, you would say, well, that tree isn't moving. But what the biologist will tell you, if you look on the inside of a tree, on the inside of that tree, that tree is growing, it is moving, and it is changing. So the point there is that even if a thing doesn't look like it is living on the outside, if on the inside a change is taking place, then that thing is considered to be alive. And so growth is an indication of life. Change is an indication of life. Movement is an indication of life. So it is with our relationship with God. God's plan for us is that we would always be growing, moving, and changing in him. The more time we spend in his presence, the longer we are with him, there should be growth movement, and change. The reality is, if we are not growing in him, then we are dying. The moment we stop growing, the moment we stop changing, the moment we stop moving in him, we are dying spiritually. Hmm. Every once in a while, you should notice a change in yourself. Every once in a while, you should notice that some of the things that used to keep you up all night don't bother you anymore. Every once in a while, you, you ought to notice that the person that you used to have difficulty to forgive, you should find yourself now praying for them and wishing them well. Every once in a while, we should feel ourselves moving closer to who we are in God. Something should be changing about us. We talked about it a little bit last Sunday that whenever we come together and we hear the word of God, something in us should change. 
Our attitude should be changing. Our viewpoints should be changing. God's plan is that we would always be growing and moving and changing in him. The Bible puts it this way, that we are being conformed into the image of Christ. That means as we are walking in our relationship with God, as we grow, as we move, as we change, we are being made more and more like him. And the Bible says in John that we do not know what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We're not like him now, but we shall be. Why? Because we're going through this process of changing to become more and more like him. The longer you spend in your relationship with God, the more like him you should become. When you stop changing towards him, you have entered the process of dying spiritually. And it is possible to come to church every Sunday and be dying spiritually. It is possible to go through all of the rituals associated with our faith and not change. Change takes place when we allow the word that we hear plant itself in our heart and start to produce the thing that it was meant to produce. When our hearts are ready to receive, that's when change takes place. You can beat somebody over the head. You can present your dissertation. You can write a 50-page paper, and you can do Facebook Live and Periscope all day long. But people don't change until they decide they are ready to change. And I just want to know, is there anybody in this room this morning who is ready to change? Yes, I want to change. The second verse of first Peter says, may God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. Change comes through knowing God. This scripture here suggests that we should constantly be growing in our knowledge of God. Peter says that as you grow in your knowledge of God, I pray that God will give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God. Now, Western thought defines Knowledge as understanding a list of facts. But Eastern thought, which includes Greek and Hebrew, knowledge is experience. In Eastern thought, you don't know a thing unless you have really experienced it. Knowledge in Eastern thought is not listing facts. It's experiencing something. That's how you have true knowledge of a thing. For example, I can never have real knowledge about childbirth because as a man, I cannot give birth to a child. Or I can know what happens in a woman's body when she gets pregnant. I can know information about the gestational period that the the baby goes in. I can know what happens through uh, labor and delivery. I can be there and help her deliver the baby, but I can never really know what it's like to give birth to a child because that's not something I can experience. So it is with knowing God. Hear me. Knowing God is not about quoting scriptures. 
Knowing God is not about listing facts about God. Knowing God is not about knowing what a dispensation is or or know where St. Peter is. Knowing God is not about memorizing the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You can stand here and quote the entire Bible, but that does not mean that you know God. In fact, there are many atheists who know more about the Bible than many Christians. There are many atheists that can quote a scripture, take you to it where scriptures that you have never heard of and they know about it. But yet they do not know God because to know God, you must experience him. How do you build your faith to the point where nobody can take you out of your faith in God? Not because you can quote a scripture, but because you rely on your experience. You say, but no, a doubter, I know where I was before I met Jesus. And I know that I have experienced a change. And I don't care how many times you quote. I don't care how many philosophers you quote. You cannot take away of the fact that before I met Jesus, I was blind, but now I see. Because I have experienced it. Paul put it this way. Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. You don't know someone until you experience. Experience them. You can know about them. You can know where they were born and who their mother is and who they're married to and how many children they are. But you don't know them for real until you spend time in their presence and have an experience with them. Fellowship Church, let us not be a church that is proficient at stating facts about God, but don't have experiences with God. Let us not be a church that is good at going through the ritual of Christianity, but we haven't had an experience with God in a long time. I don't want to come here and just go through the motions. When I come here, when we gather together, my expectation is that somewhere God will show up and we will have an experience with him before we leave this room. Not only that, but I expect at some time during the week that I will have an experience with God that will confirm that he is still with me, that he's still on my side. I expect that when I'm driving down the highway in my car, every once in a while, I'm going to have an experience with God. My expectation is that I am not just someone who quotes the Bible, but I am someone who has a relationship with God and I experience it him all the time that's why you cannot tell me that he is not real because I have experienced too much of him to not deny what I have experienced we are not a church that just quotes scripture but we are a church that have a relationship with the living God Peter says that as we grow in our knowledge of God God will give us more grace, which is favor, and more peace, which is stillness. Here is the thing. The more you experience God, the more peace you have. The more you experience God, the more of his grace and his favor you have. Because you understand your relationship with him is not tied to what is happening in your life. But your relationship with him is tied to who he is. And you know who he is. So how do we grow in our knowledge of God? The first thing we have to do is spend time in his word. God is his word. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Can I share this with you? You cannot know more about God than you know about his word. You cannot love God more than you love his word. You cannot trust and obey God more than you trust and obey his word. I was shocked one day because I heard somebody say, 
that they trust and obey God's word. But they read the word one day and there's some things in the word that don't apply to them. They prayed about it and God said, you don't have to to do that. They prayed about it and said, it's it's so okay that you're in this situation. I won't say what this situation is, but they, they, because of their prayer with God, they said that God said they don't have to do that. Listen, you cannot say you trust and obey God if you don't trust and obey his word. Oh, I, oh, I'm going to offend somebody here, right here. Listen, if you trust and obey God, you must trust and obey his word because God is his word. And God will never tell you to do something that's contradictory to his word. Because if he does that, then that makes him a lie. And he is not a man that he should lie. The Bible says he cannot lie. Hmm. So we're challenged now. Because we don't get to define who God is. God is who he is. We get to experience him, but we cannot pick and choose what part of the word of God that we want to believe. We got to do everything that's in his word. So not only do we have to study his word to grow in knowledge with him. But then we have to put his word in action. Listen, this is not the time to live in the world and not know the word of God. In this age of alternative facts, we need to know the word. The Bible says you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The Bible says that his word is truth. We can know the truth even in this world. And there's such deception going out in this world that most days you don't know what to believe. The only truth that there is that will never change is the word of God. Can I preach old school this morning? We got to go back to the time when it's not about how we feel or what the culture says. We have to go back to the time where if it's in God's word, we believe it and we're going to obey it no matter what the culture demonstrates to us. So we have to put it in action. If you want to grow in the knowledge of God, you must put the word in action. It's not enough to study the word, but you must experience the word. Well, how do you experience the word? You test it. You try it out. For example, the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Well, how do you know whether or not that is true? This is how you know. You obey God even when it makes you sacrifice something and find out if what God had for you was better than what you had to sacrifice. Huh? Test it out. He says, I'll keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on me. How do you know that is true? How can you experience God in that? Stop spending so much time thinking about and talking about your problems. Spend more time thinking about and talking about Jesus and see if you have more peace in your life. See if that knot in your stomach goes away. See if you're able to sleep at night because you've decided not to flood your mind with the issues and challenges of life, but you've decided to keep your mind on Jesus and his promises and his word and his power and see if you experience more peace in your life. God wants to do something with us. God is pulling us and pushing us into levels we have not seen before. But the only way we can be guided through that process is if we are growing in our knowledge and our experience with him. And whatever you experience in life, the only way you know whether or not it is of God is that you have to have the template of his word. If someone comes to you and says something to you, it must agree with his word. I don't care how nice it sounds. 
or how popular it sounds. If it doesn't agree with his word, it is not true. And I'm, I'm so concerned that many people are being led astray because we believe what sounds good, but we don't know the truth because we don't spend time in God's word. And it's a cultural thing because people don't read books anymore. People don't read newspapers anymore. You got to tell it to them in 30 seconds or less. If you don't get it to them in 30 seconds or less, if it's not a video, they're not watching it. And we are missing the word of God and we're missing the truth because we won't get still enough to read. It shouldn't be hard for us to read one chapter of the Bible a day. That should not be a hard thing. Can I just be real practical with you this morning? It should not be hard for you to read one chapter from the Bible a day. How many hours a day do we spend watching TV or on Facebook or talking on the phone? It should not be that difficult and the adversary's plan is to keep this book closed or keep your your phone off the or keep the Bible app on your phone closed because this is the only thing that will defeat him in our lives. If we're being defeated, we're being defeated because we don't use the word of God, which is the sword. If you look at the armor of God, our only defensive weapon is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Everything else is for defense. The helmet of salvation is for the shield of faith. All of those things are offense. Our only defense is the word of God so he don't care about our rituals just keep this book closed and if you read it just doubt it if you read it skip over what you don't like don't don't believe anything that offends you only believe the good thing just believe that God is love don't believe the scripture that said it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God no God is love that's why the Pope is trying to change the Lord's prayer because it says lead us not into temptation oh he says that the father would lead us into temptation Mr. Pope you cannot change this prayer it's not your prayer it's the Lord's prayer and you are not the Lord. I hope y'all recorded that. Send that to the Vatican. He is not the Lord. Jesus is Lord and his word is true. Let me get back to this text. (laughs) Verse 3, then we'll be closing for today. Hmm. If you don't do anything else this year, focus your attention on studying God's word. Hebrews, uh, verse number three, second Peter, verse three. He says, by this, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. I heard what he said. It says by his divine power, he has given us everything we need to live a godly life. One of the most challenging things Jesus said about believers is that we are to be in the world, but not of it. Hmm. That can be a difficult concept to understand. It's like saying you can go swimming as long as you don't get wet. You'll get that on your way home. It seems impossible, Jesus, that we can live in this world and not be of it. And being of it means to adopt the practices of this world. This is the only world that we know. But Jesus says once you come into relationship with me, You have to be in it, but not of it. And so the world says that it's impossible. It's impossible for you to be in the world and not of it. So the world says to us, it's impossible for people to live according to the Bible in 2018. The world says the Bible has lost its relevance. The the day is is past to to living according to the Bible. It's impossible for you to think that in 2018, a young person would save themselves for their marriage. 
The world says it's impossible to think that your husband is going to be faithful to you because all men are dogs. All men cheat. The world tells us that it's impossible for us to maintain our faith in spite of all the trouble that we see in the world. The world tells us it is impossible for us to be good to people who are not good to us. The world says it is impossible to think that everybody doesn't lie every once in a while and everybody cheats on their taxes and everybody does what they can do to get away. It's impossible, the world says for us to live holy and sanctified lives in 2018. It's a, it's a different culture, but Peter says that by the power of God, he has given us everything we need to live godly. Hallelujah. And with God, all things are possible. Yes. So the world says, no, it's, it's impossible for you to think that this could happen. But this verse confirms that God has given us everything we need to live God. That godly life is a life that pleases God. A godly life is a life that reflects the holiness of God. And Peter confirms that God has given us everything that we need to live godly. In the face of the world who tells us that we cannot do it. Peter says, God has given us everything we need to do it. Now this promise is a general and yet specific promise that God has given us everything that we need. It is general because it's not specific. In this text, he does not say what everything is. He just says he has given us everything that we need. And I like the, the generalness of this statement because it makes room for the fact that there may be some things that, that you need to make the crooked places straight in your life that are different from what I need to make the crooked places straight in my life. Different plants and animals need different environments to live and and to thrive. And so the scripture suggests that God puts us where we need to be in order for us to grow spiritually, that he he creates a place for us where we can grow and receive all that we need for living godly in this world. And the thing about it is that my job is not to judge what you need in order to live godly. My job is to make sure that I am doing what I'm supposed to do. You know, sometimes we make the mistake when God tells you not to go to the movies, that all of a sudden nobody at the church can go oh, I don't want to offend nobody but we used to say that if the pastor felt like he couldn't do it then nobody in the church could do it I come to tell you to do what you have to do in order to maintain your relationship with God and don't let nobody talk you out of your commitment that you've made to keep yourself sanctified from this world separated from the darkness of this world if it means you need to turn everything off then you do what you have to do to maintain your relationship with God. And the world will tell you it doesn't take all of that. And I say to the world, if it took Jesus to die on the cross for my sins, if it took him to leave the comfort of heaven and become like a man and suffer and die, there is nothing that I can do that is too much for him. So, God gives us what we need. But then this promise is specific, and I promise you we're almost done here. This promise is specific because as we search the scriptures, I find three main things that God gives us in order for us to be able to live godly. The first thing we've talked about already, the first thing he has given us is his word. Where would we be without his word? How would we know the truth of who he is without 
his word. How will we know the power that is available to us without his word? When he has given us his word, he has given us him because the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So if you have the word on the inside of you, you have God on the inside of you. That's why the Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I can live godly in this world because God lives in me and the power is not of myself but the power comes from God I can do what is right not because of Tim Bruington but I can do it because God is living on the inside of me I have God's word hidden in my heart David said that I might not sin against thee David said create in me a clean heart oh God and renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy joy from me his word gets settled in us so we have what we need because we have his word. Second thing we have, God has given us each other. When you look at the word, I see a responsibility that believers have to each other. Can I tell you, you are a gift. I am a gift. You are God's gift to me and I am God's gift to you and we need to stop saying as long as I have God I don't need nobody else that is not the truth you don't need everybody but you need somebody oh y'all don't like me but I don't care you don't need everybody but you need somebody praying for you you need somebody holding you accountable you need somebody helping you carry your burdens you need somebody to walk with you through the fire and trials of this life you don't need everybody but God made you to need somebody and I need you and whether you like it or not, you need me. We sharpen each other. We move ourselves closer to our relationship with God. We hold each other up and say, yes, we can live godly even in this world because we're not doing it by ourselves, but we're linked arm to arm with our brothers and sisters in Christ and we are marching on our way to Zion and no adversary in hell can stop us because God has given us him, but he has also given us each other. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a gift. Open up your mouth, say, I'm a gift. I'm a gift. You know what that means? We cannot disregard each other because we're gifts. God gave us to each other. So if I disrespect you, I disrespect the gift that you are. It's like you give somebody a gift and they say, I don't want that. I don't like that. That's what we do when we treat each other wrong. That's what we're saying. We're saying, God, I don't like this gift that you gave me. Your brother and your sisters in Christ are a gift. And if you get to heaven, they got to help you get there. So y'all don't like me. All right. Well, if you didn't like that, you definitely not going to like this third point. <laughs> That's all right. We're almost done. The third thing that God gives us to help us live godly is affliction. Whew. It's affliction. I was talking to someone this week and we had a moment of complete transparency and we admitted to each other the fact that we realized that if it wasn't for our affliction, we would not pursue God the way that we do. Now that may not be your testimony, so don't look this way. <laughs> But we admitted the fact that the things that we have suffered in our life has pushed us to be desperate for an experience with God right here and right now. Affliction says, if you are who you say you are, I need you right here and right now. God, if your word is true, I need you to show up. And do you know what we have found? Every time we've gotten desperate for him and say, God, if you are who you say you are, I need you to show up right now. Somehow, some way he shows up and confirms his presence is with us. David, David put it this way. David said, it was good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes, that my affliction has caused me to grow in God. Affliction is how God 
changes us. The things that we go through is how God conforms us into his image. So some of the things that he has given us in order for us to live godly is affliction. Don't resent your affliction. Because for some of us, if it wasn't for the affliction, we wouldn't be here this morning. Some of us, the only reason we came here this morning is because we need God to say something about this affliction that I'm going through. And here's what he has to say about your affliction. He says, I'm using it to pull you closer to me. Oh, yeah. I'm using it because it's time for you to grow up. I'm using it because I'm stretching you, I am pruning you, I am pulling you, and listen, you're looking good for my side. You looking, every time I look at you, you're looking more and more like me. Ain't it wonderful when you look at your children and they look like you? That's what God is saying. I'm looking at you, and every time you get through one test, you look more and more like me, and it brings me pleasure, and it brings me joy. And you're going to make it. I want you, you can stand to your feet out. We'll finish this next week. We'll pass our time today. I don't know what your challenge is this morning. I don't know what you are facing or what you are, are dealing with. I don't know what decisions you have to, to make over the next month or so. What you are confronted with but I know this that God has given you everything you need did y'all hear what I'm saying I need you to sit on that for a minute wherever you are in your life right now know this God has given you everything you need You're going to get through this test. You're going to conquer it. You're going to overcome it because you already have everything you need. Hear the word of the Lord today. I've already provided a way of escape. I've already settled it in heaven. I've already equipped you with everything you need. To live godly. Make the right decision. Sometimes we feel like we're giving in to the pressure of this world and we say, God, why should I do the right thing when nobody else around me is? God, why should I be faithful when everybody around me is unfaithful? Why should I be consistent when everybody else is inconsistent? God, I don't know if I have what it takes, but I come to tell you, my brothers and my sisters, God has given you everything you need we're going to pray but 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says we are troubled on every side yet not distressed we are perplexed but not in despair we are persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. God has given us what we need. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning, for how you have spoken to us. Lord, it is in you that we live and move and have our being. We stand here recognizing that our life is in your hands. We thank you, Lord, that we know that you have a perfect plan for us. Your will is good, it is perfect, and it is pleasing. We thank you, God, for giving us everything we need to live godly. That even in this dark world, God, we will live lives that reflect your goodness and your holiness God you are the potter we are the clay mold us into vessels of honor that please you 
in the name of Jesus. Lord, we make ourselves available to you. Not some of us, but all of us, every part of us. We make ourselves available to you. Use us as instruments of your peace and your grace in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that we are growing in you. We thank you, Lord, that we are ever changing, becoming more and more like you. Until that great day when we are standing face to face, no more wrestling with the issues of this world, but finally we see you face to face. Hallelujah, God. Until that day comes, help us to be faithful servants. So that when we stand there, we will hear you say the great words that, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. We want to serve you, God. Hallelujah. Because you are worthy of our service. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah, God. You are worthy of our life. We offer you our life today. In the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that as Peter said in verse 2, that the more we know you, the more we grow in our knowledge of you, you will give us more grace and more peace. Hallelujah. So I speak peace and grace to this congregation today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen for 30 seconds. Those who will, can you just lift your hands and surrender to God? This here is a moment of surrender. We're not asking for anything in this moment. We're lifting our hands. Say, God, we give up. We surrender to you. Whatever you want to do with our lives, you can do it. No more resistance. No more talking ourselves out of it. No more doubting it. But today, we walk in it. Hallelujah. Whatever it is you want, God. Hallelujah. Wherever you want us, we're willing to go. These are your hands. Use them. These are your feet. Take them where you want them to go. This is your mouth put words in this mouth and it will speak for you. It is so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And bless God. Hallelujah. Clap your hands for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your assignment is to change whatever atmosphere you go into this week. Go into that atmosphere realizing that you are a change agent. That where there is darkness, you bring light. Where there is confusion, you bring peace. Where there is sadness, you bring joy. The Bible says we are the light of the world. We got to leave this place this morning determined to change wherever we are. I was coming here today and the scripture dropped in my mind that we are fishers of men. Hmm. Our job is to go fishing. I'm not a good fisherman. I think Paul's going to train me one day, but I understand that there's there's a way to prepare to go fishing. You got to know what time to be there, where they're biting at. Hmm. Thank you, Bert. Early in the morning. You got to get the right type of bait. Hmm. Listen, what we learn in marketing is that you go after the low-hanging fruit first. In other words, don't try to convince somebody who's totally against it. Try to convince somebody who's undecided. There are people in your life who are undecided. I need you to help them make a decision for Jesus this week. 
huh? And you can't do that when you go into the office and you're mad like everybody else, and you're sad like everybody else, and you gossip like everybody else. No. You got to give them a reason to choose Jesus. Hallelujah. They got to look at your life and say, listen, if that's what Jesus does for you, I want him. I don't need a Jesus that keeps me depressed. I don't have that handle all by myself. I need a Jesus that can give me joy and peace and confidence. Set us up for eternity. Y'all ready to fulfill your assignment this week? We're going fishing this week, saints. Hallelujah. We're going fishing. Look around you. See, listen to these conversations that you are hearing every day. God is opening doors for you to interject Jesus. And you have to pay attention. I know you are wherever you are to do a job. Do your job and do your work. But have your spiritual ear attentive to what's going on around you. Because there's some fish in the pond that you visit every day. And Jesus is saying, it's time to reel them in. The coming of the Lord is near. It's time for the harvest to come on. And do I have a church that believes in the harvest of souls? How do we care about the souls and we just care about ourselves? Let me tell you, this is not a church. I know I'm keeping you all long, but eternity is a long time. <laughs> I'm not going to be longer than eternity, so you'll be all right. <laughs> Listen, I know all of us have things that we have laid on the altar things we need God to do for us on a personal level. Things that we weep over and sometimes they keep us up at night and we wonder, Lord, when when are things going to change? When are you going to fix this? But the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. We have to have the kingdom agenda. God's kingdom is an ever-expanding kingdom and it doesn't expand in land and property and program but it expands in souls every time somebody's born again the kingdom of God expands and every king wants the largest kingdom he can have and we are citizens of the kingdom and our assignment is to expand the kingdom and you do that by going fishing this week and real amen. Y'all hear what God's saying to us? All right, let's pray. If you need prayer after service, please come. Let us pray for you. God's putting us on an assignment. That's what happens when you fast and pray. God changes some things, and he's changing us. Oh, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word that you have spoken. We thank you that we accept the assignment that you have given us to be fishermen this week. Give us sensitivity to know who's undecided amongst us so that we can help them to make a decision for you. Use us to expand thy kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Use us for your glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hi. My name is Tim Brewington, and I am the pastor of Fellowship Church. Thank you for viewing this broadcast today. For more information about Fellowship Church, please check us out at www.thefellowshipmn.org. God bless you.